You're listening to the Common Descent Podcast. Hello, Will. Hey there, David. Hello, listeners, and welcome to episode eight of the yeah. Common Descent Podcast. Thanks for joining us again. Absolutely. So, hey, remember how last episode was cool and special because it was the first time we had a special guest to help us with a topic? It was pretty great. Well, this episode is cool and special because this is the first episode whose topic comes from a fan request. Yeah, it, slowly but surely, we are going to convert it so that really you all get to run the podcast and then we'll listen to it. <laughs> You're doing all the work. And <laughs> that's our long-term plan. <laughs> Absolutely. So someday we will get all the credit and the fans will just do all the decision making. Yes, I like it. So yeah, this episode comes from a request from Josh on Facebook. The topic of today's episode is conservation paleontology which is a, a really interesting, very young field mm -hmm. within within the science where we're basically merging those two things, conservation and paleontology. Yeah, this was, this was sparked from one of the news articles you read in one of our earlier episodes that he yes. responded to. Indeed it was. So this, uh, before we get started and all that, I do want to take a moment and tell people that are listening that it has been really cool in the past few weeks to be getting as much fan interaction as we have. Yeah, it's always exciting when we hear from a new person. Yeah, so we've gotten a handful of requests, which we uh, have put on our list. We've had some more conversations and interactions with people on Facebook and on Twitter. We got a couple new iTunes reviews that I noticed, so those are really nice. Uh, actually, uh, funnily enough, I happened to log into our YouTube account the other day, and I noticed that our episode one, so for people who haven't been here since the beginning, we originally put the first episode up on YouTube before we switched over to other to podcast hosting softwares, mm -hmm. and two people left comments on our YouTube video <laughs> that I had never noticed. <laughs> so apologize to those, apologies to those two people. <laughs> for never not getting a response to those. I just noticed them. <laughs> uh, yeah. And then our, according to Podbean, we just, in the last few days, as of this recording, surpassed 2,000 total downloads. Thank you, everyone. That's awesome. Which is super cool. Uh, and then probably my favorite thing, fan-related, that happened this week was we learned via a Twitter conversation yes. that there is a five-year-old boy out there in the world named Darwin who listens to our podcast with his mom in the car. Apparently he requests it. We are one of his, one of the things that he really likes to listen to. That's fantastic. Which is great. So Darwin, I hope you're listening. You are awesome. Yes, absolutely. Thanks for listening and you have amazing <laughs> taste. <laughs> yes, you do. You have great taste. <laughs> if we may oh. say so. No, that's that's really awesome. That was that was by far one of the coolest things since starting this was getting to hear about that. It was really that was really something special. Yeah. So we we love hearing from the fans. Uh we're happy to to chat with you, to take your questions and requests, so please keep them coming. It is a lot of fun. Absolutely. We we are all ears. Indeed, we are. We're also mouths. Yeah, two rather large ones. Big, yes. And indeed, in fact, now we're going to start using them. <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, so let's jump in. I, I say that every episode, I think. Let's jump in. Yeah. Let's... That's going to be part of a Common Descent podcast drinking game sometime in the future. Yeah, well, we, what people don't realize is we, we jump every time we say that. We we literally... We literally jump. We've got our, our microphones, our software, our recording software, and our tramplings. <laughs> <laughs> this is how we get exercises podcast. during the podcast. That's uh, the only exercise we get. Yeah, that's it. We are lazy, lazy people. Hey, Will, let's talk about news. All right, sounds good. Do you want to go first? Or you want me to head this one up? Uh, you go. All right, cool. So my first one is is a fun one. It's it's not too long, but it it's a neat subject. So it is about a fairly well known fossil organism called a sea scorpions. Hmm. And a recent discovery that shows that they very well may have been using their pointed and serrated tail to, dis as the article puts it, dispatch their prey. 
Uh, <laughs> that's awesome. <laughs> Which is cool because they were called sea scorpions because they very superficially look like scorpions, and they were mm-hmm. they were aquatic animals. These are known as the Eurypterids, and they were around after the Cambrian explosion. So we're looking about the Ordovician to the Permian, about 460 to 248 million years ago. They ranged in size from six inches long to six feet long. Yes. So these were very widespread. There are evidently even some lake species, which I did not know until looking this up. Hmm. Yeah, interesting. But they ranged in size. They were, as for most part, very well known to be predators. Some of them have significant claws for grabbing their prey, but this was a specimen found that showed a potentially new behavior. So first off, this study is uh, was published in The American Naturalist, and it was done by the University of Alberta by Scott Persons and John Acorn, and they found a specimen in Scotland that was a very well-preserved body, you know, most of the body, and especially the tail segment. Hmm. And this is the first time they've gotten evidence of how the tail segment was able to move, or really. And so this was a specimen of Eurypterid known as, or the species was Slimonia acunate? Acunidae? Acunamatata. Acunamatata. I know, it's, it looks like acunate, <laughs> and I know that it's not acunate, but... <laughs> I, think it's, I think it's acuminata. Acuminata is what sounds right. Uh, but the yeah. first time I read it, I'm like, you can't end it with an E. Slimo- <laughs> Slimonia hakuna matata. Yes. <laughs> so this is not a new species, but this new specimen shows the cur- the tail curved sideways, like a very tight curve, but to one side. So interesting thing, their tails are compressed top to bottom, so they're, it's flat-tailed body sections that actually could not move, uh, from what they can see, up and down. So they weren't swimming like a dolphin which is what most animations that you would see in documentaries showing them showed them doing. Huh. And so they, they weren't using it, but evidently very flexible side to side. The observations they were making about this is that flattening, instead of being an adaptation for swimming, meant that they could swing their tail with very little resistance. It was hydrodynamic sideways instead of being a good pushing Oh, so it's like a sword exactly. or an airplane wing yeah. cutting through the water. Exactly. So the idea is that this predator very well could be going up and grabbing prey items with its claws that they're very well known for having up front mm-hmm. and then whipping its tail either one direction or either direction it's into the side of the prey and killing it with that, that blow from the point of the tail. That makes Eurypterids slightly more terrifying than they were before. Right? And I love it because it's it's one of those things where they were called scorpions. Like, they are arthropods, so mm-hmm. they are distant related, as all arthropods are, to arachnids. Yeah. But right. they were by no means like the first scorpions. They just looked a lot like scorpions. Right. So that's why we called them that. It's the same reason you hear saber-toothed tiger, because his tiger sounds cooler than cat. <laughs> yes. It's the same. <laughs> but lo and behold, they may have actually been... <laughs> Killing with their tail, much like a scorpion. That's cool. But I guess instead of... Because you, you, when you said that they, it, it looked like the tail doesn't flex up and yeah, down... Yeah, so they're not going over the back. Was, exa- they're not scorpion yeah. striking. They're doing a side-to-side movement. Really cool. Yeah, and like when you see the fossil, it's very well preserved, and it really is. It's like a perfect U-bend coming right back around. So... An, an interesting hunting technique, uh, which leads me also to want to know the question of now I really want to know how they were swimming. And like, I'm really curious to see how these things were moving around yeah. in the water, if they were swimming or if they are mostly scuttling. I would also wonder how widespread that is, because this new scorpion, this new Eurypterid, uh, I don't and I don't remember, so correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't think it's a huge one. No, it, it was not uh, ridiculously big. The, the scale marker they get for the fossil is only five centimeters, so this thing would have been, you know, maybe the better part of a foot once it was, okay. you know, all stretched out, if I'm doing my quick metric conversions really quick. <laughs> Interesting. But when you, like you said earlier... The biggest Eurypterids could be five, six, maybe seven feet, mm-hmm. or um, you know, two meters long. Exactly. I wonder if they had a similar strategy. Yeah, and and they are definitely different because you'll see plenty of Eurypterids where they've got they've got feeding parts up front, but some of the bigger ones and the famous ones actually had very you know sizable pincers, you know, 
hmm. long crab-like pincers. So, you know, it could very well be. It's sort of like even, you know, once again, with modern scorpions, there are plenty of scorpions that don't really hunt or have to usually hunt with their stinger. You know, the big, the ones with the big meaty claws don't have, you know, always have very potent venoms because they have claws that they can just literally crush the cricket. They don't need to right, right. ever sting it because the claw is bigger than the cricket. Yeah. You know? So you may not need to use your tail if you're tearing things apart with claws, but this, so far, this is the only one they've seen with this sort of evidence. So, like you point out, whether it's widespread or whether this was a weird one, but it is showing a body position we did not previously know they could or would make. That's cool. Eurypterids have a little special place for me, uh, because not only are they cool, but, and in case there are any fellow New Yorkers out there listening to our podcast, a Eurypterid is the New York State fossil. Yes, it is. Eurypterus remipes, which is, is commonly found up north, upstate, and it's a small one. It's not, it's not a huge one, and I don't know a whole lot about it, admittedly. Um, but I've seen fossils of it, and it's a neat little critter. They're they're pretty cool. They're they're one of those. They're always right up there with trilobites for me. To where this was a widespread species and lineage, uh, or lineage more accurately. But this was a very widespread animal. They were very diverse. They were a unique kind of predator that we yeah. don't have today. Like Eurypterids, for a while, were the dominant predator in yeah. the oceans before you know vertebrate predators started taking over that role and we don't have that you know you don't see ecosystems where aquatic arthropods are the dominant predator except on micro scale with like water beetles and you know yeah. dragonfly nymphs which is always what i kind of like they're obviously not functioning the same that's always kind of what my brain goes to is these were really big versions of that but eating yeah. everything it's always interesting uh because i wrote a, an article just this week about a new cambrian sea creature yes it was a cambrian arthropod and it was really interesting to write a description of it and say, you know, this was before fish had taken off. This was before you had most big groups of animal life. And I wrote a description of it and I said, you know, that basically said at 10 centimeters long, it was one of the most formidable predators <laughs> in, in its environment. Because, yeah, there wasn't much big back then. Yeah, it's, it, like there's no reason to be big yet because things hadn't gotten big, so... What was the point? Yeah. It's that's the most fascinating thing to me about the early seas is these were ecosystems that, and we've mentioned this many times before, but this goes more so for this than anything else. That's an ecosystem that we have almost no parallel for. Yeah, it's it's an ecosystem based almost entirely, you know, of invertebrates or early early vertebrates, and you know, so the predator prey were all the same general body design. Yeah, which is really crazy. It's cool stuff. We'll have to do an episode about that stuff. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, Cambrian and pre and post is really cool time. Absolutely. But this is not an episode about Eurypterids. No, as much as it may sound like it at this point, <laughs> it is not. And so for our next news piece, we are going to move to the opposite end of the Phanerozoic and go to very, very recent stuff. So this is a news piece. This is a, a new study about the discovery of ancient DNA without fossils, which is really exciting. Yeah. So one of the things that's, that's really interesting uh, that modern biologists have started doing is looking for DNA in the environment. Mm -hmm. That you can scoop some pond water and detect DNA from the creatures that live in it. Well, a group of scientists led by Viviane Slon, and this was published in Science Magazine, or uh, in the, the journal Science, that... Basically, they were saying, well, if we can find DNA bonded to the minerals in bone in fossils, could it be preserved among the minerals in sediments? Mm -hmm. So they sampled some cave sediments ranging, you know, all across Europe. I think these are all European caves ranging from a few tens of thousands of years to hundreds of thousands of years old at the end of the Ice Age. And they did, in fact, find and they did, in fact, find DNA not just from mammoths and woolly rhinos and bears and hyenas, but from humans. They found the DNA remnants of Neanderthals in a few caves and the mysterious Denisovans, which is an ancient species of, of human relative that is only known from DNA for the most part. It's very cool. Yeah, so this is interesting because, you know, ancient human remains are pretty hard to come by. So if we can find DNA of ancient hominins, 
in caves or in sites where they may have been living, it basically gives us an additional avenue to look for evidence for these creatures, that we don't even actually need the fossils of them to identify them from genetic material. Yeah, and that's that's the cool thing about any time we find paleo-DNA is awesome. Whenever we find a new way to find paleo-DNA is really cool, because now that, that means we could go through with this process and any applicable site with similar conditions, this process can now be used... And it's it's like it's getting it's like when you learn something new about your favorite show, and so rewatching all the episodes makes it even better because now you, you <laughs> yeah. oh, I didn't realize that person you know had a nervous twitch that they worked it into the character. I'm gonna watch for it. It's, this is like that. You can now go back through previous fossil sites using this new technique, and f- yep. sites that we thought we had combed over completely might suddenly yield DNA. Yeah, and indeed, I think that's what they did. I think they went to a handful of known that's cave awesome. sites. Because one of the well, the one site where they found Denisovan DNA was in Denisova Cave, where that species was originally discovered. That's really cool. Yeah. So a quick little note, and, and it it's a fun study because it might be the beginning of a new methodology. It's it really is because even as even just as far back as when we were you know starting in school, not grad school, but you know earlier school, the idea of paleogenetics was still one of those where it's like, well, yeah, we found like frozen stuff with it. But past that, <laughs> you're really not going to... And then now it's become more and more common as we've learned how to look for it. Yeah. Which is... is It's something that if you went back 50 years and told paleontologists that it's like, hey, we're going to be studying the genetics of not just one or two, but, you know, a dozen or so different paleo species, you know, recently extinct species, uh, and we'll actually have a decent sequencing of some of them. <laughs> they would have all been like, yeah, we all like sci-fi too, but... <laughs> <laughs> My undergraduate advisor, Russ Graham, actually had a story about him standing up at a conference and confidently stating that a search for ancient DNA and fossils is pointless and it will never happen. And and why would we why would we try to do that? And then eating his words not too long afterwards. Yeah, I mean, it's <laughs> we, we really are... It's really exciting in paleontology right now because... The technology is, as it does in all sciences, as technology progresses, new techniques and methods develop in the different scientific fields. But paleontology, it has been crazy how many different things have been happening just within the last couple of decades of, you know, CT scanning becoming a thing and, you know, reconstructions and microbiology and DNA all coming up as not just new but regular fields of study. Yeah. As technology has gotten better, and it's really cool. All of those are potential other episodes. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> lots lots to get. Lots lots to talk about. We're going to talk about them all right now, then we're... No. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So my last uh, subject, my last news article, is actually harkening back to some older news articles that we had going back to the megafaunal extinction of yeah. all the large mammals across the world, uh, but in specifically different uh, particular spots. So this is a, a recent study that was done on megafaunal species and fossils. Uh, I think they had about a, a, a wide selection. It was a, over 500 different bones that they hmm. did this on from across the world, uh, Europe, Siberia, and the Americas. And it was an international com- combining of effort. And they found, by looking at isotopes in the bones, every single, just about all of them are, showed a increase in moisture right before the extinction events on the different continents. Interesting. So this is the very end of the Ice Age. Mm-hmm. And we're talking about moisture in their environments. Yes. And so this yeah. increase in moisture, they are crediting as one of the, maybe either the main or one of the potential causes for the ensuing megafaunal extinction that came up. And as a reminder for anyone that uh, may not have heard or may have forgotten the past news article we talked about, the megafaunal extinction at this time has been a highly debated subject in paleontology as to whether Mm -hmm. the climate was to blame mostly or humans were to blame. Because this extinction lines up almost perfectly in most places with humans arriving in those locations. Yeah. So it's a, it was one of those where there are two smoking guns. This was all during a 
large global climatic change, but also during a mass, you know, uh, migrations of humans into new environments. And it's been debated whether the climate wiped them out or whether we either hunted them to extinction or outcompeted certain species. Yeah. And it's gone back and forth because depending on what evidence you look at, it points to one answer or the other. This mm -hmm. new study is a very, is going obviously with the climactic route, but it is very intriguing and very strong evidence because it was studying the bones directly. Yeah. So basically what they were thinking happening happened with the moisture is that while permafrost and the glaciers were beginning to melt at the end of the ice, that particular ice age, was that that increase in moisture being released into the environment started transforming grasslands into wetlands, bogs, marshes, peat, mm -hmm. you know, swamps, and so forth. And this broke up the grasslands, which separated out the large grazing herbivores that were so dominant in that ecosystem and disrupted that ecosystem causing mass extinction. Interesting. Or I guess at the very least exacerbating mass yes. extinction. Yeah. Somehow fitting into this so big it, picture. Somehow that it factored in. Now it's it's very cool because what they were studying was a uh, nitrogen isotope in the collagen of the bones of a number of different animals. Uh, bison, horse, and llamas were all in the list of animals that they studied. And it showed in j all the cases an increase in moisture. Cool thing being that not all the extinctions happened at the same time on all the continents, but each one mm. showed an increase in moisture before the extinction. Interesting. That increase in moisture predated the extinction event just about every time. And they pointed out that in the grassland ecosystem, the megafauna, the big grazing animals, act as one of the uh, keystone species, you could call them, basically by grazing and moving, you know, vast distances over their grazing land as they move from new food to new food, they transport nutrients. You know, they eat this grass, mm -hmm. they move over there to that grass, poop the old grass out, and then move on. And they trans they keep the nutrients spread around so that it's constantly evening out across the ecosystem, so on and so forth. Once you break up the grassland to where now it's grassland, marsh, grassland, and the elephant isn't as good at getting across the marsh, or the bison don't really like the marsh, or it doesn't have the right grass for them, whatever it may be, it now has separated those grasslands and they're not distributing the nutrients as evenly. So the ecosystem collapses, which causes those megafauna to also go extinct or head toward extinction. That is, that's actually something to keep in mind because that is a, that, that's related to a subject I'm going to be bringing up yes. later in this episode. Now, the other side that they point out, this is like the little tidbit on the end, is this, if this is uh, accurate, if this is an accurate reading of this information, then it actually answers one of the questions as to Africa's situation, because Africa has not experienced the same level as megafaunal extinction as other places. We still have elephants hmm. and big grazing herds, and mo all the animals that basically went extinct everywhere else are still in Africa. You know, yeah. That's why we always point to Africa as the example of what North America used to look like and so forth. Yeah. And they're saying that because Africa being around the equator has always been uh had grass you know, constant grasslands even around the monsoon areas, these grasslands were much more stable and never broke down due to any rises in moisture. Interesting. And so that really that moisture and grassland ecosystem was a big part of it. Cool. Yeah. An interesting piece to a big puzzle. Absolutely. And this this was just uh so everyone knows it's published in Nature and it was the Australia Australian Center for Ancient DNA was the place and it was Professor Alan Cooper and the lead author was Tim Rad Radanus Wallace. Cool. There are centers for ancient DNA research. Right? <laughs> right? <laughs> it's a crazy thing we have now. It's dr just drive the last point home. It's pretty cool world we live in at this point. Indeed. So speaking of controversial finds, the last news article we're going to go about, this one I wanted to bring in because this hit this week and it has been all over uh, yield interwebs. There is a new study that just came out in Nature, led by Stephen Holland, that purports to be the oldest evidence of humans in North America. Now, that sounds dramatic, mm -hmm. but does not capture what this study is trying to to, to say. <laughs> so there is a long, long history of debate 
over when humans first made it to North America, mm -hmm. right? We started in Africa, we spread across Europe and Asia, you know, and ultimately eventually made it to Australia, Pacific Islands, and the Americas. For a very long time now, the oldest definitive human remains in North America are the Clovis peoples and some sites from slightly before the Clovis peoples coming in at around 13 to 14,000 years old. There's genetic evidence to suggest that we may have been around in North America as early as 20 some thousand years ago, even though there's no actual fossil evidence for it. This study from a Pleistocene site in San Diego called the Ceruti Mastodon site claims to put evidence forth that there were humans in North America 130,000 years ago which is a preposterous claim. Doesn't mean it's not true, but it is absolutely preposterous. Yeah, it, it's way more than what had previously, any numbers that have previously been thrown around. Way more. And as you might imagine, this is extremely controversial. Mm -hmm. um, in fact, what we'll put on the blog is I'll link to Ed Young's piece on The Atlantic about this, because he interviewed a whole bunch of different researchers and got their opinions on it. Basically, the two bits of evidence for this, one is that there are, right, there's no human bones, there's no definitive human tools, but there are stones that look like they've been modified the way humans modify tools, and the bones of one of the, of, of this, this mastodon fossil have breaks in the bones that look like the kind of breaks you get when humans are chipping away mm -hmm. at bones, cutting meat off and breaking the bones and things like that. And uranium thorium dating puts these bones at about 130,000 years old. If they're right, not only is this way earlier than humans are thought to have made it here, but that's a time where Homo sapiens hadn't made it out of Africa yet. Mm -hmm. Which means that this could very well be a different hominin species. In addition to the Neanderthals and Homo sapiens and the Denisovans and all the others we know about, there may have been an American branch around back then. Yeah, of tool-using hominid. Yes. However, lots of skepticism. There are some people who, who doubt the accuracy of their dating methods. It's mm -hmm. only, you know, you want to corroborate those things in future studies. It's very difficult to show definitively that, what, that your rocks are tools mm -hmm. or that the damage on mastodon bones is actually caused by people. That, that, that's a really hard sell, especially in a case like this. Some researchers have also pointed out that if this is accurate, it's super weird that there's no other evidence of people here anywhere in between these times. It's super weird that there's no evidence of hominins traveling across like the Arctic before this time to get there. So this could very well be true. And if it is, it's a huge discovery. But as with so many things in science, especially the extraordinary claims, this is not it, the, the community does not seem ready to accept this just yet. Yes. There, there will be more evidence needed. Yeah, as we have all often said and will always say, this is one study, so yes, could turn out to be completely accurate, could turn out to be half accurate, or completely wrong. So it's still in its infancy, but it's it's something to look into. That's a a very cool thing, and it brings up a an issue that happens with many other situations and studies of when the only evidence you have is secondhand evidence. You know, you don't have any bones from the hominins, you don't have any mm -hmm. remains like you know definitive things like a cave drawing. It is right. a modified natural thing, a, a modified stone. It's not a built tool, but a modif it's really hard to determine, was this made by hand or by a river? You know, was this yeah. made by wind or by, you know, on purpose? And, you know, that that happens with lots of other situations when, you know, people studying different things. Uh, I remember, I can't, I think it was Jeff in grad school, but talking about debates on the locations of different species based on cave drawings by trying to determine yeah. was it a bison or a buffalo or a you know a a yak or a you know what each animal in a cave drawing is cuz if you can identify what's in the cave drawing you know those people were seeing that animal yes but then again it be it's like trying to interpret someone else's art it's like oh this is just <laughs> how i draw horses <laughs> this is yeah. I, i'm not very good <laughs> uh i forget they don't have horns um, <laughs> but it's that same issue. Yeah, so the, it's, it's a, it's an example of, you know, and we've had this, this has come up a bit before where this is 
really cool, but this will be resolved by future studies. And, mm -hmm. and apparently there have been claims like this before of really ancient hominin remains in North America that have all ended up sort of falling to the wayside because the evidence didn't hold up. Yeah. They were shown to be inaccurate. So we'll see. It, it could turn out to be really, really interesting. It's an exciting thing, but as it becomes a practice of scientists to do, whenever something really exciting comes up, it, it's much like when you see a really cool-looking trailer for a movie. <laughs> it looks awesome. Let's wait until we hear a little bit more <laughs> before we... <laughs> That trailer looked so cool. I really enjoyed the, the, the use of Bohemian Rhapsody, but I don't, I don't know. Yeah, well, it's, just, it's, it's easy to make a, a cool-looking trailer. <laughs> I feel like all the jokes were in the trailer. Yeah. We're, we're just going to have to wait and see. Yep, yep. <laughs> we're looking at you, DC. Um. <laughs> uh, we just lost I know. half of those listeners. <laughs> <laughs> well... <laughs> I liked him up to this point. He took it one sentence too far. That was it. <laughs> that, was, that was too much. Anyway, <clears throat> now let's move on to our main event. So, like I said, today's episode topic is conservation paleontology, the intersection of study of the past and the study to preserve modern-day ecosystems. Once again, this was recommended, requested by Josh on Facebook, so thanks very much, Josh, for getting in touch with us. Yeah. Uh, thank you to everyone who's given us suggestions. Conservation paleontology, or conservation paleobiology, as it's often called, is a really interesting field because it's new. You know, this is the last several years or so that this has really been building a, a foundation of work and methods and, 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 a, and a direction and everything. So this episode is going to be a bit of a whirlwind, as our, our episodes often are, of basically an overview of what this field is and what it aims to do and what it has done. But to start, we should briefly talk about what conservation is. Yes. So conservation is this notion that we want to preserve natural ecosystem. Mm -hmm. uh, this is why we keep track of endangered species, because we don't want them to go extinct. Yes. This is why we're fight. You know, humans are a bit of a plague, and we <laughs> pollute, and we destroy habitats, and we introduce invasive species, and we overhunt endangered species. Yes. And, and it makes a mess of the natural world. As any animal would if they could also use a gun, is a point I always like to make. <laughs> <laughs> this is a fair point. Yeah, it's Absolutely. The reason we're screwing up the ecosystem is because we are still following our natural prerogative to feed, consume, reproduce, spread out. But now we have yes. guns and planes and tanks, and so nothing can stop us. <laughs> <laughs> and indeed, the argument for conservation basically goes, we are at a point where we know better. Exactly. We have gotten to a level where we should be able to ascend above just survival. Mentality. Yes, and I I, th I think that the argument tries to go in from two different directions. There is the responsibility argument, mm -hmm. where it is, hey, we're doing this, and why don't we not do this? Because we can and we should stop and maybe reverse some of the negative effects we're having on the environment. And if that doesn't appeal to you, then there's also the selfish argument, which is a perfectly valid argument, mm -hmm. and it is that the natural world is where we get our stuff. Yeah. We grow our crops in the natural world, and we get our food from the natural world and our resources. So if we mess up natural ecosystems, it's only so long before we start feeling the repercussions of that. Yeah, when you, when you pull from something that only replenishes so quickly, and you're pulling ten times that amount out every year, it, eventually it runs out. Yeah, it's going to catch up to mm -hmm. us. So in recent years, there's been this sort of drive to among paleontologists to kind of point out that, hey, there's a lot we can learn from the fossil record, as goes this subject. And this is something that we actually talked a bunch about way back in episode one, mm -hmm. this question of what does the fossil record tell us yeah. about ecosystems and, and, and how can it be applied to preserving modern day ecosystems. So for example, you know, we when we're looking at the, the ecosystems around us, and we want to say, okay, this change is happening. How do ecosystems respond to these kinds of changes? 
well, we can't make the change and then watch what happened exactly. very easily. We only have one planet, mm-hmm. but there's millions of years of, of case studies mm-hmm. in the fossil record that show us how did this species react to changing climate, to invasive species being introduced, and so on. Even past past examples of what happened the last time humans showed up on an island or showed up in a yes. mountain. Like, we can even look at our own history into how did things react the first time we showed up. Absolutely. We can also look at, this is one of the things that comes up a lot in conservation is this notion of, well, we want, you know, we want to return the world to the way that it's supposed to be. Well, how do we know what it's supposed to be like? Mm -hmm. How do we know what an ecosystem is supposed to look like? How do we know what a healthy ecosystem is? Mm -hmm. And that's another thing that we get that from studies of the past that we can see. Uh, One of the, one of my favorite quotes, and I said this way back in episode one, is that one of the biggest benefits of paleontology is that it is the only field of study that you, through which you can study a world untouched by humans. Yes. A world we hadn't started messing up. Mm -hmm. And it's with that view, you know, it, because there's tons of things, you know, we talked about it in the, the first news article that really touched on this with the oyster farm, the oyster reefs and Mm -hmm. that conservation study is comparing what the first colonists saw, you know, or the first explorer saw to what it was like two million years ago is very different, you know, that we can't just take what's in our recorded history as the goal to get back to or what was the norm. Looking over all of it gives you that view of you know, the fact it's easy to forget that we just came out of an ice age and yes. are still like what we see as normal. And the reason people always have the question of why was everything so much cooler but in the past? Well, because we, we're <laughs> just now still responding from everything dying out. Like, yes. we just experienced a mass extinction and what we have is what's left. So we humans came in and started messing with stuff already when things were not what they have been. Yeah. So that leads nicely into this first topic that uh, we're going to talk about, and that is the ability of conservation paleontology to distinguish between human impacts Mm -hmm. and natural impacts, or human-caused situations and natural situations, keeping in mind, of course, that the difference between natural and artificial is artificial, (laughs) but the idea being that something we've modified is not necessarily healthy or stable. Yeah, and and this is an important question to ask because it's easy nowadays to think that every extinction is a tragedy, but you have to remember that things go extinct all the time. Like, that's yeah. that's been happening since there have been things alive to go extinct. So some things are going to still go extinct, natu- you know, just by the natural process, but we also cause a lot of things to go extinct. So being able to tell that difference can be important. Yes. So one of the big things that that, that comes up in, in this field is basically looking at an ecosystem and saying, okay, is this an ecosystem that we should be preserving? Or is this an ecosystem that is something that we basically have changed? Mm-hmm. So this is the difference between novel ecosystems, which are things that humans have created that have only been around for, you know, decades or maybe a few centuries, versus historical ecosystems, which have been operational and functional for a very long time. And a historical ecosystem is important because if you know it's been working for thousands of years, that tells you it's a stable, healthy ecosystem. Exactly. If it ain't broke. Yes. <laughs> Probably the best example of this, and, and the most classic example, is Yellowstone. Mm-hmm. So here in the U.S., at West, Yellowstone National Park has been targeted for all sorts of conservation plans. Mm-hmm. One of the most famous things in Yellowstone that, that's, that's been a project was the reintroduction of wolves. Yes. So basically saying, hey, we wiped out the wolves here, let's put them back and restore this ecosystem. But one of the big questions that got asked when this was starting was, so this area you want to put wolves be- into, were they there in the first mm-hmm. place? Or are you putting them in a place that they don't belong or that they were you saw them in because they were forced there by humans in the first mm-hmm. place? And this is a case where fossil studies help to resolve this. 
There have been a number of different fossil studies on uh, all or parts of Yellowstone that have found that wolves and elk, their main prey item, as well as many of the other mammal species, have been there roughly in similar, you know, similar species, similar places for several thousand years. That's a historical ecosystem. That's important to know because that tells you that this is an ecosystem structure that works. Mm -hmm. uh, studies have also shown similar things about the vegetation. So, so we have this notion, this, this vision from the fossil record that the way Yellowstone is now is at least de a decent representation of what it has been for a long time, mm -hmm. which is very, very important to know when aiming to restore it. A counterexample to that, basically an opposite example, uh, there is a study. So, so one of the the big sources of information for this, there is there was this big review paper that just came out earlier this year by Tony Barnosky and you know twenty million other people on this this paper that reviewed this field and they put a bunch of examples of all sorts of different studies. So a lot of the studies I'm citing were cited from that paper. So in the blog post, I'll probably put a link to that Very cool. uh, particular review. One of the studies that was cited in there was a study on grasslands in California mm -hmm. that found, based on the fossils, that when cattle were introduced to the grasslands, they essentially wiped out a bunch of the native grasses, which were then replaced by invasive grasses, mm -hmm. which has left us with these grasslands that are not historical ecosystems. This is an air, this is a, this is an ecosystem that we messed up. Mm -hmm. And so telling the difference is really, really important for then gauging how to deal with this environment in conservation efforts. And it's important to distinguish that because there are a lot of things that are very iconic of different ecosystems and places that are not the historical, you know, the, the natural way that it was set up. The, my go-to yes. example is always dingoes, which are... <laughs> That's a good one. Which are, for most people... Like second to kangaroos and maybe koala, you know, maybe third to koalas <laughs> are like the yeah. animal you think of when you think of Australian animal. You know, dingoes. A dingo ate my baby is yep. <laughs> the go-to. I'm imitating an Australian phrase, and yes. they there were no placental mammals. <laughs> like no. So a dingo, dingoes were brought over with the first humans, the first yes. human settlers that brought them. They were domesticated that went wild and you know, so cuz and it, the reason this is significant is i have seen things talking about the fact that there are no more purebred wild dingoes you know they're interbred with <laughs> domesticated dogs it's like no no they are domesticated dogs yes they have always been domesticated dogs that they're not a natural animal there but they get treated that way many times because they've been there in our minds so long yeah. and they are so iconic to that place but they're not supposed yeah. to be there this came up in our islands episode mm -hmm. because in doing the research for that episode was when I learned that coconut trees are not native to like Hawaii. Yeah, exactly. And we brought them there. Yeah, or here. Like Florida has tons of them and they're no, they're not supposed to they're brought <laughs> in because they look cool and now they yeah. are the image of those two places. You know. Yep. Stuff like that happens all the time and it's really easy for us to forget that Five hundred years is not a long time. No, it's long for us because that's like five generations or six generations. You know, but that's not very long when you look in an ecosystem. Yeah, it's and and that is really important. You know, just because we made something that way mm -hmm. doesn't mean it works. Yeah, just because your great grandfather. <laughs> <laughs> and the world is full of examples of pasture lands and you know logged forests that are you know they exist now but are they healthy uh, and this 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 plus your example of the dingoes harkens back to the oysters mm -hmm. which i did want to bring up again so this is a new study that we brought up uh episode four yeah and this was the study that inspired josh to make his request of a study in the chesapeake bay that looked at oyster populations going back tens and hundreds of thousands of years Basically, oysters are a big deal in commercial fisheries. And oyster, it's, it's incredible, especially here on Long Island, the history of oysters as a cultural, you know, hallmark. Oh, yeah. I goes have friends, way back. Uh, there's people at the aquarium that have talked about coming from up north and not liking oysters. Mm -hmm. And just to talk about the reactions they get from people who are like, what? How can you not <laughs> like oysters? And yeah, they, they were a staple for mm -hmm. a long time and they still are. 
the oyster reefs are not necessarily healthy. Yeah. And so to figure out why, this study, which was done through William and Mary, looked back at the archaeological and the fossil record and found that the structure of oyster reefs for tens and hundreds of thousands of years was different from what we have today. In that particular case, the what was different was that the healthy, long-term oyster reefs of the past had these big, old, what they called grandma oysters. Because apparently, when oysters reach a certain age, they all become females and start pumping out lots of baby oysters. And modern-day oyster farms are missing a lot of the big oysters because that's who we fish up. Yeah. The big ones. And so this leads to basically guiding plans for how to conserve these reefs. In this case, you know, there I believe there are regulations that say you're not supposed to fish up oysters below a certain size because those are the babies and we want them to grow up. This study was saying, well, we should be prioritizing the biggest oysters because they are the ones that are making lots and lots of more babies. Yeah, they're the the producers, the suppliers of that reef. Yeah. Yes, and my favorite quote, and I said it last time, I'll say it again, from the, the, the press that came out about this study, from one of the, the scientists who said, a manager of the Chesapeake Bay has never seen a healthy oyster reef, because we've been modifying them for hundreds of years. Is that like, we've since we've found out they were down there, we've been hunting them? Uh, yes. Because they can't run away. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Poor oysters. And and this is really quick before we go on. We mentioned this a little bit in the island uh, episode, but it's good to reinstate it, is we keep saying healthy ecosystems, you know, versus our modified ones. And I, there's definitely, I'm sure there's some people wondering, and there's definitely a question to be asked of, you know, what, what do you consider a healthy ecosystem? Just because it yeah. wasn't messed with by people doesn't mean it was a great ecosystem. And that's true. And basically what healthy typically refers to is stable. That's really mm -hmm. another term for stable. And stable ecosystems typically are either the more diverse an ecosystem is or the, and really what it means is the less susceptible to change. And yes. diverse diversity is a big part of this because now if a sudden cold frost comes through, and even if it does completely wipe out one species of flower or five species of flower, but if you have 20 species of flower in your field, mm -hmm. no one's going to notice. Like maybe yeah. a couple of species will suffer because of that that specialized in those now extinct flowers. But in general, the grassland is not going to collapse. But if your grassland consists of two species of grass, two species of shrub, and two species of tree that <laughs> make up that ecosystem, if anything happens to any one of those species, it could just collapse on itself. And now you will lose, you know, a lot more of the species than you would had had it been a diverse and therefore more stable ecosystem. Uh, now exactly. This, this, once again, only matters if you care about there being more animals. You know, <laughs> if you don't care about <laughs> the animals, then I guess it doesn't matter if there's five kinds of deer or two. But from an ecological standpoint, you know, you don't have to see these moments of, oh, the, the weather changed for, you know, 50 years, and now this entire swath of this com continent is almost barren because the ecosystem just couldn't yeah. handle it, which has happened in, you know, past times. You know, Pangaea had that where it was so dry in the middle, just wiped everything out, and it could happen very easily in our continents today if it's a unstable situation. Yeah, and that's really getting at that note. You know, it's not that we want to save pandas yes, or save tigers. It's that we want to make ecosystems that will sustain themselves. Mm -hmm. And to do that, you need diversity, like you said. You need nutrients moving smoothly through the different levels of your food web. And you need that resilience. You need your environment to be stable. Yes. And you need your species to be healthy and genetically diverse within a species and diverse between species. And basically, you know, if it if it starts to miss some of these things, it's not a concern that the deer are going to go extinct. It's that the deer are going to go extinct and then the entire food web is going to fall down. It's like a company, you know, it's not we're not worried about one person getting fired. We're worrying about the company going under because we don't have what we need to maintain the status quo. Exactly. What, what we call a, a trophic cascade. Yes. Which we talked about in episode five. Yeah. About the KPG extinction. Uh, my favorite example being when you were 
you brought up the wolves being re reintroduced to Yellowstone is my all-time favorite example of a trophy cascade, and we'll have to put this in the, the blog if we run to because it's an awesome video. Yes. The wolves being reintroduced completely changed aspects of the environment all the way down to how the rivers flowed because yeah. the deer stopped frequenting areas where they were more easily hunted, which included along waterways where the wolves could know that they would regularly gather, so they started pulling back from there. They stopped browsing as heavily on the trees and plants at the riverside, which let them grow bigger and stabilize the riverbank, which locked the river into its shape and caused it to stop overflowing its banks as much, stop meandering and lock into a shape, which allows it to deepen and slow down, which opens it up for a lot of other wildlife to live in the slower water now. Mm -hmm. So that's like, that's what we're talking about is the addition of one predator, one yeah. big keystone predator affected just about every other animal in those forests because of yeah. the effects it has on everyone else. Uh, and that's a topic that uh, we'll definitely return to, because yeah. uh, a topic I want to address later on in this episode will rely on this notion that, you know, basically paleontolog paleontological studies can show you what those pieces are that mm -hmm. you need to establish an ecosystem that is sustainable and functions. Looking at paleontology is like looking at the front of the jigsaw puzzle box. Uh. Yes. <laughs> Uh, one thing that I wanted to mention real quick on the note of basically normal ecosystem function versus, you know, stuff that's been interrupted by humans. This is a study, there was a study in, in the 90s on commercial fish species in California. So apparently it, with sardines and anchovies, which are big, important fish species for commercial fishing, throughout the 20th century, it had been noticed that these species would regularly crash in their populations and then explode again mm. so that they would that the populations would fall apart and then it's called boom and bust mm -hmm, cycles mm -hmm. and for a long time it was sort of inferred that you know we have messed up this ecosystem somehow and so this study went into the fossil record to basically see if they could figure out what had changed and what they found was that this cycling of boom and bust in the population had been going on for about 2000 years <laughs> And that it was probably related to weather cycles. Probably yeah. they, they cited El Nino. Oh, that makes sense. As being what caused these fluctuations in the fish populations, which is a really cool example that I think we don't think about very often of a case where we exonerated ourselves mm -hmm. and said, hey, there's this weird thing happening. That's actually supposed to happen. And that's a really important message to get f that that we can see these long term trends. And sometimes they're not about us. Other times they are, especially with cycling. You know, this this brings up the, the question that always comes up in the issue of climate change, where you'll hear a lot of people say, well, but the climate goes through cycles. Yeah, it always is changing. Like, right. Yes, but we can see those cycles mm -hmm. in the fossil record and compare what has happened in the past to what is happening now. It's the, yes, we know, we looked too. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but that, that comparison of, some of the things that are going on are in fact part of normal function, whereas the th there are a number of things that are out of whack. Yeah, and teasing out teasing out those things is really important. Yeah, it's it's a case by case study. It really is like you know each ecological seeming disaster, or each ecosystem, and each conservation subject is has to be studied. You know, separately from the rest, just about because one animal mm -hmm. reacting to a change is completely different than how another animal reacts or how it's been living. So you really do just have to look at each one individually and do all the same studies for it because you never know what might have already been going on. Yeah. So that that issue of, you know, teasing out human impacts from natural occurrences is a very important starting point. Another thing that conservation paleontology really keys in on and allows us to do is identify when change happens, how do ecosystems respond? Mm -hmm. So one of the biggest things with conservation, you know, when we think about conservation, we often think about, all right, well, this habitat is messed up. How do we fix it? But a, a, a huge part of conservation these days is saying this ecosystem is vulnerable how will we protect it from future change? Because this change isn't isn't stopping. Yeah. You know, pollution, habitat loss, 
changing climate, rising sea levels. These are things that are going to continue Mm -hmm. into the future. And like we said before, the fossil record provides a long list of references for how ecosystems respond to change. And what you were just saying about different species reacting differently is uh, really cool, because there was a couple of studies cited in that Barnowski review that pointed to that exact phenomenon. They were looking at climate change in the past mm-hmm. between in, in a couple different scenarios, and it cited two studies, one on corals in Australia that found that in the past, during a cooling period, at a time where the weather was, uh, the climate was getting colder, the corals just moved, yeah. that they gradually shifted north following the warmer waters. But another study that did a similar analysis on Arctic foxes in Europe during a warming climate period found that the Arctic foxes didn't move. For some reason, they weren't able to move, so they just stayed where they were, and their populations shrunk and eventually disappeared. Interesting. Leaving behind only the ones that we have today. Yeah. So just like you were saying, different species in different situations will respond to change differently. Mm Mm-hmm. And understanding what causes those differences in change is really important for assisting with species and changing in changing environments today. Yeah, it's it's really the heart of those who don't learn from history. It, this is yes. looking at history to figure out what we can do now. Uh, and it really is it's a cool application because we at the aquarium we work with corals, and one of the things that we and other people doing the same study, the coral restoration effort down in the Keys, is they are looking for, since we kind of know where the environment and climate is going, Mm -hmm. let's figure out which corals will continue. You know, we don't want to replant and then have those corals die anyway. Yes. Which corals will continue to do better. And so they've done things where they can simulate a more acidic or a more, you know, a warmer or whatever changes they need to. They can make an artificial, you know, you know, tank greenhouse that they can then simulate those conditions and see which ones do better. Using paleontology is doing that, but the experiment's already done. Yes. And you're now just looking back at the results. That's really cool. Mm Mm-hmm. Interesting. Another really interesting case of past change informing our response to future change comes out of Joshua Tree National Park in California where this is these are this is an ecosystem based around these trees these Joshua mm-hmm. trees and we know from the fossil record that the trees don't disperse quickly and they don't migrate quickly mm-hmm. and so in the past there have been times of high temperatures and drier climates that have really spelled trouble for the trees which is exactly what we're looking forward to in the future of rising temperatures drier climates and understanding how these trees respond in this case not very well is important for us to know especially since the trees these days are doing a really rough job of migrating and dispersing because the animals that dispersed their seeds aren't here anymore Mm -hmm. predominantly it seems to have been giant ground slots yeah so if we want to preserve these ecosystems we know by looking at the the fossil record of the ecology of these trees that we need this this takes stronger intervention Mm -hmm. we we, we're going to need to hold these trees hands so to speak (laughs) until we find a scenario that works out for them it's interesting when you get into situations like this because you know i've heard people who often ask like well, how how is it any less natural for us to step in and do these things uh, mm-hmm. when we come into help a species? And that's, it's not a wrong statement uh, or question to ask. Is yes, we are still stepping in and you know putting our hand into it, but with the intent of not only preserving but continuing a stable ecosystem. Of if you want there to still be forests up there in yes. four generations, then we need to help that forest shift. You know, it's you know, trees are no trees. <laughs> it's yeah, and so but exactly. there there are those moments where the environment can no longer just bounce back by itself. Yep. Uh, and I wanted to also bring up on that subject of response to change, mm-hmm. and this this goes back. We bring up islands all the time. Oh yeah, because they're they're perfect little miniature case studies. It really does come up a lot. And you mentioned this earlier, and and I hope this episode doesn't feel like it's bouncing too much, um, but you keep mentioning really cool things that I have notes for later. (laughs) 
Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you're, you're going out of order. Keep getting ahead. Of I'm going to start talking um, about different subject ideas we had. Uh, you know, sometimes <laughs> like you know what I've been thinking about deep time. No. <laughs> I've been thinking a lot about whales. Yeah. No whales. Stop it. <laughs> have we have we talked about T Rex and whether or not they had feathers yet? I think we need to talk about that. Right now. <laughs> <sighs> That's it. Next episode, just me. Just David We're splitting up the band. This is it. We're split, it's like Mike and Ike. We're breaking up. So, you know, the, the examples that I've listed so far have been examples of how species in the past have responded to, you know, quote, natural change. But you mentioned before that we can also look into the past and see how species have responded to human intervention. Mm -hmm. And there actually was a study done. Uh, not too long ago, by Boyer, which looked at across a whole bunch of different Pacific islands over the past 3,000 years or so and looked at patterns of extinction following human arrival in birds. Mm, cool. And what was really interesting was that what this study was aiming to find was what are the features of the birds or the island that make them most likely to go extinct. Mm. And they were able to essentially rank to a degree these features. And they found that if a bird was large bodied didn't fly you know if it was endemic if this was the only if it only was found on one island um their diet factored in that these factors were the main determinants of whether or not these animals disappeared when humans arrived as opposed to right there were factors that were surprisingly not a big deal like the size of the island or the location of the island interesting and that's a huge bit of information for us to know what, you know, what are the risk factors for a species in a changing environment? What species do we have to keep an eye on? Mm -hmm. And we can guess at this. It's super easy to say, well, that species lives in the water, so pollution's going to hurt it. Yeah. And yeah, we're probably right, but nothing beats having an example to look at and say, look, this happened. We have 10 times that this happened in the past. Here are the consistencies. That's really cool. Here's what we need to be keeping in mind. It, it's it's a profile. Like it's that's it's letting us profile the animals in the ecosystem. You know, it's it's like being able to uh predict serial killers. It's we're being able to predict. <laughs> <laughs> it's like oh this yeah. this little chubby brown you know ground pigeon is going to have a yes. hard time <laughs> if we don't do something about it now. Yeah, absolutely. That's really cool. Yeah, it, it's the, again. I'm, I've pulled a handful of cases. This field is dense. There's a lot to it. Well, and we're in the the you know infancy. Of, we're in the where it is spreading out fast and quickly. You know, so we're getting to see really the the takeoff of this new aspect of paleontology, which is really cool. Yeah, absolutely. Real quick, another one of another fun little case example that came out of uh, my research on responses to change was condors, which are of course an iconic endangered species example. Condors. 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 <laughs> if I were breeding a <laughs> flock of condors, <laughs> you would have nothing to say about it. <laughs> Listen, John. <laughs> So uh, there have been studies that have looked at basically, right, so condors during that megafaunal extinction, when the world went to heck a little bit, and the Ice Age came to a close and things started disappearing, lots of birds disappeared, but condors made it. Hmm. Uh, they didn't make it well, because today they've needed a lot of help from us in the continuing deteriorating environments. Mm -hmm. There have been studies, isotope studies, on the bones of these birds that have found that their diet was an important factor in the extinction, that you had birds back then who relied on the carcasses of the large mammals. Mm -hmm. And when the large mammals disappeared, the birds disappeared. Condors survived partially, probably, because they were also feeding on coastal carcasses. Oh, gotcha. Marine mammals. But in recent times, as the marine mammals have been dwindling because of human impacts because mm -hmm. we're hunting them and this and that condor diet has shifted again more towards the terrestrial regime because we've filled the land with cows and such yep. so now they're feeding on animals on the land but their history is feeding on marine mammals 
so if we want to preserve this species we might need to you know it might be that we first have to replenish these marine species yeah. so again looking at how species respond to change how ecosystems respond to change is essential in guiding our own efforts to protect them from change in the future yeah because it's you know uh, that really brings up the good point of there's tons of times where you can see something's wrong in the ecosystem and you go all right we got to stop doing this thing to fix it and often that's right you know it's uh, hey there's a lot fewer alligators than there were when we first landed here uh, has anyone mm -hmm. been shooting these a whole lot oh yeah we have okay we should stop doing that <laughs> so much cut it out <laughs> But then there's plenty of times when an animal is doing poorly and the obvious answer may not actually be the correct one or the simplest. Yeah. You know, there may be a much simpler answer once you look at, well, what did they actually used to do? All right, well, then all we have to do is tweak this and they will begin yeah. balance, balancing out and we won't have to redo our entire economical structure that depends on this one <laughs> You know, we can just tweak something. It gives, it leads you toward the actual solution, hopefully. Yeah. So we've talked about conservation paleontology showing us, right, helping us to distinguish between what we have done to ecosystems mm -hmm. versus healthy structures. Uh, we talked about looking at how changes in the past have affected species. The final category that I want to talk about, and we got into this a little bit, is this notion of understanding what makes a healthy ecosystem. Yeah. You know, not just has Yellowstone been around for a while, so it is healthy, but why is it healthy? What, you know, if we're going to engineer an ecosystem, we need to know what makes it work. Yeah. And as we hinted at before, there have been studies uh, through the fossil record that have shown that the longest lasting ecosystems have certain features in common, right? That they have certain, you know, the, the distribution of animals of different sizes is similar. The number of animals at each trophic level, that is to say, you know, herbivores versus primary predators versus secondary predators, you know, what kind of vegetation, the patterns of vegetation, patterns of diversity, there are features of an ecosystem that are consistent in the longest lasting healthy yeah, ecosystem. ratios that work yep. best. And one of the one of the really interesting things about this is that the features of an ecosystem that make it healthy are independent of the species present. Nice. Which is to say, you don't need tigers, mm -hmm. but you do need a tiger niche to be filled. Yeah, an apex predator. And this is why a lot of conservation efforts these days are kind of moving away from saving individual species and more towards saving ecosystems. Mm -hmm. We can save the tiger, that's awesome, but if in the process of saving the tiger we lost all of its prey, then it doesn't matter if we save the tiger. Then we'll never stop saving the tiger. <laughs> yes. And this leads into this interesting notion of what's called rewilding. Mm -hmm. And so the basic idea of rewilding, before we get into the, the really crazy version of this, <laughs> uh, which we'll touch on in a, in a second, but the basic notion of rewilding is basically to I said basic seven thousand times. Leave that in. Don't cut that out. <laughs> it's a very. Basic. I'm ridiculous. <laughs> so basically, the basic basic concept basically says so that on a basic level, in order to ah <laughs> uh, fourteen on the pH scale, <laughs> super super basic. <laughs> We're talking bleach here, people. I could go for some. We the idea is that. We want to establish healthy ecosystems and healthy habitats. Mm -hmm. So uh, there are initiatives to rewild across North America, Europe, Australia. And what they're kind of focused on is making sure that we're introducing the important species, right? Reestablishing the ranges of wolves and bison and things like that. Um, in Australia, there's an initiative to reestablish Tasmanian devils to their historic range to put them back to where they belonged. There's also big pushes for establishing connections between different patches of wilderness. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that animals have wide habitat areas to explore, which is important uh, for healthy ecosystems, as we know. Restoring waterways, restoring fire regimes in forests. Yeah. You know, rewilding is basically saying, let's put our ecosystems back to a healthy level yeah. by engineering them. Exactly. It's as simple as like the, the road connectors, you know, patches yes. of green, you know, green across roadways so that 
deer don't have to cross the street, they can walk over it. Cause yes, exactly. little things like that, a road can divide populations enough to destabilize. Little things Absolutely. can make a big difference. Uh, I wrote an article about that this week, about uh, mountain lions in Los Angeles. Oh, right. That they've been split by roadways, and it's caused all sorts of... They fight more because their territories are smaller, their genetic diversity is is reduced because they can't get to other places, so they're just inbreeding all the time. Mm -hmm. So yeah, bigger habitats are generally better. However, there is a school of thought that basically says, I said it again, there is a school of thought that says that the classic vision of rewilding, putting ecosystems back to what they were, you know, a few hundred years ago, isn't good enough. Yeah. There are scientists that make the point that human impact on the ecosystem goes back a long time, that we have been over hunting and meddling, introducing invasive species and, and changing fire patterns and forests and such. You know, we're implicated as a major player in the quaternary megafaunal extinction. Mm -hmm. So this is a school of thought championed by a, a guy named Josh Donlin in the 2000s that says, instead of trying to restore ecosystems back a few hundred years, we should be aiming to restore ecosystems to what they were 10 or 20,000 years ago. Yeah. This is called Pleistocene rewilding. And boy, is it a controversial idea. <laughs> it's, it's interesting is what it is. <laughs> yeah. So the idea is, and Donlin wrote, and I will put this in the blog post, but he, he and colleagues put together these two papers in 2005 and 2006 that laid out the idea. Yeah, and I remember when these when these came out. Like I remember when they hit because it was a big deal. Yeah, and and in those they explain that our ecosystems have lost some of their major players. Mm -hmm. Right, the extinctions of big herbivores, especially like you were saying before about how they affect the the structure of their ecosystem. Yeah, their keystone species. Yep, is important for dispersal of plants, for controlling vegetation, for moving nutrients around, like we mentioned before. You know, there was a study in, in the early 2000s that found that wild horses grazing in salt marshes reduced vegetation and increased the diversity of birds and shellfish. <laughs> that these horses are engineering the environment. So Donlin's point is, all right, let's bring back horses. They were here during the Ice Age. They went extinct. Let's bring them back. Another initiative is tortoises in Mexico. There are bolson tortoises that seem to be really important for dispersing plants. And they used to be all over Mexico in the, in the late Pleistocene, but they're not anymore. So Donlin's point is let's reestablish them all across Mexico. Mm -hmm. And so he's encouraging this conservation approach of let's bring back the important herbivores reintroduce wild horses across North America and also Europe. Camels, bring camels back because yeah. they were here. This starts to get a bit controversial <laughs> when he says, well, you know what we also need is <laughs> elephants because there were mammoths in the mm -hmm. northern continents back then that were important keystone species. And then it gets really controversial. <laughs> you need both sides when of the coin. You make, yeah, then that's exactly it. You can't just introduce lots of big herbivores. Because that's not a stable ecosystem. You need that next trophic level, and the next trophic level is filled with lions and cheetahs. <laughs> now, in his original proposal, Donlin said, yes, eventually we should put lions and cheetahs, you know, big cats across the mm. northern continent. Midwest. <laughs> yeah. To recreate these ecosystems of the Pleistocene back when everything was functional, it doesn't matter if you have woolly mammoths and saber-toothed cats. As long as you have giant herbivores and large carnivores that can control them. Yeah, as you said, the species does not actually matter for a stable ecosystem. It's as long as all of the roles are filled. Yes. So this is super controversial. Lots of people don't like the idea. But we've started doing this. <laughs> a couple of quick examples. Um, so... A famous example is in the Indian Ocean, uh, when humans arrived in the Mascarene Islands and the Seychelles Islands, we wiped out giant tortoises mm -hmm. from every island except one. There is only one giant tortoise species left in that region. As part of a conservation initiative, local wildlife groups in 2000 took some of those remaining tortoises, the, Aldal the Aldabra giant tortoise, 
and put them on another island. Mm -hmm. And over the course of the next several years, they noticed that the trees on the island are not only dispersing better, but germinating better. Cool. Because the tortoises were taken away and they were an important part of the ecosystem function. Yeah. Uh, another example, and this is a really cool one, in Europe there is a an initiative called the Tauros Program, which is not about Pokemon. <laughs> Unfortunately. Yeah. This is an initiative to breed back the ancestors of cattle. Right, right. I've heard uh, about so that. So before... Before cattle were cattle, they were aurochs, which are like the the Conan the Barbarian version of cattle. Like they were, they're wild, they're hardy, they eat wild plants. You know, they were all over Europe. We wiped them out in in the process of domesticating them and turning them into the weird, you know, walking beef steaks yeah, yeah, that we have today. Yeah, grocery stores. Exactly. But there's this initiative to say, well, what if we just breed cattle to have those traits again, mm -hmm. and then release them? and then establish wild colonies. Uh, this is started, there's similar initiatives with horses, to basically, well, these were wild animals before we came along, so let's breed them to approximate what they used to be. Yeah. And, and reestablish their role in the ecosystem. Cause it, and it's part of the controversy of, of this thinking is the fact that anyone who has ever taken even the smallest amount of a conservation biology class or listen to someone in one knows that introduction of species by people to other places has just about always been bad yes is that <laughs> us introducing it, that's why we call them invasive species us introducing animals to other places for our own benefit or by accident almost always ends in often incredibly negatively for that environment. Yeah. So the idea of saying, okay, but what if we do it the right way and bigger? <laughs> uh, like, yeah, triggers immediately the idea of, what are you, stupid? Like, <laughs> have we not talked about the cane toad? It's it's a bad idea. Yes. <laughs> and that's where a lot of, a lot of the, uh, the opponents basically point that out, that we really don't know enough to be doing this. Yeah, that it's, that it's a pompous idea to think... I think we can design an ecosystem, you know? Yes. And it's one of those where we may be able to dissect an ecosystem, but it would be the same thing as saying, all right, now build a cat, now that you've dissected one in class. <laughs> it's, yeah. There's a whole lot that you may miss, you know? The elephant may not do well here because of one weird thing. A lion may yep. not decide to hunt, you know, we may put, it's like, all right, you hunt gazelles, we put gazelles. He goes, yeah, but white-tailed deer are a lot easier, and I'm going to wipe yeah. those out. Because <laughs> that's what typically happens when we yeah. introduce an animal for a job is there's a third job we didn't even know about that yep. that animal finds and does extremely too well and goes <laughs> off the rails. And so it's the idea is not a bad one on the surface of if we recreate the ecosystems back to what they were 500, you know, before settlers got here, that still may not be a stable ecosystem. Like, that still may eventually break down. Yep. We need to, the idea that we really have to go back all the way to when it was really, really stable. You know, to where yep. it took a global climatic ice age to destabilize it. Not something that will take just a bit of trees being cut down. Yeah. And the idea is there, but it is on a scale that probably aren't ready for yet. Yeah. And that's what a lot of the opposition says. And that's, I think, why most of the bits and pieces of this that have gotten through are, you know, really minor, just, you know, learning initiatives, you know, to see, can we actually do this? Let's experiment in a small way. Yeah. The best example, and you cannot talk about Pleistocene rewilding without bringing this up. In Siberia, there is a man, a pioneering man named Sergei Zimov, who started, who has a little reserve, a sort of biological reserve, where he has started introducing megafauna again to recreate Ice Age ecosystems. He calls it Pleistocene Park, because <laughs> what else would you call yeah. it? He's recently, I think, passed this along to his son. But the idea is they want to restore the grassland ecosystems of the north that disappeared when the megafauna disappeared. Yeah. This idea that the the big herbivores keep the 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 ecosystem the way that it quote should be. Mm -hmm. And so over the past several years, they have introduced horses, bison, muskox, reindeer, and moose to 
to this preserve and observed how they affect the environment. And what they found is that they keep down the woody plants and are transforming the forest into grassland. Very cool. And not only that, but they disturb the snow, which keeps the soil exposed to the cold air, which keeps the methane trapped in the permafrost. Oh. Which is a big deal, because as the world warms, if that methane starts to melt out, that's a lot of greenhouse gas. Yeah. And what they're essentially trying to do is make the mammoth step which is a type of grassland biome that doesn't exist anymore mm -hmm. because the large herbivores that maintained it across the northern continents have disappeared. Uh, this is a small preserve right now. If you want to learn more about this, and you totally should because it's ridiculous and awesome, um, <laughs> we'll put links in the blog post, absolutely. Um, there's a video somewhere of, of Sergey talking about how, you know, he's got horses and bison and such, but he really needs mammoths, but he doesn't have mammoths, so he uses a tank <laughs> to knock down trees. <laughs> <laughs> I mean... What else would you use? <laughs> yeah, but eventually what he wants to do, this is sort of a pilot study to see, does this sort of environmental in engineering work? Can we reestablish these old ecosystems? And his dream is to spread it across Europe and Asia and North America and establish these healthy, yeah. ancient approximations uh, of, of stable ecosystems, which is really interesting might be completely stupid, but he's learning a lot of really interesting stuff. It's really cool because once you start getting into the, the stuff with the Pleistocene rewilding where we cannot reintroduce ground sloths and mammoths and saber-toothed cats and, you know, ca giant cave bears, but yes. we can reintroduce analogs to those ecological niches. Yeah. But you start getting into, you know, there's the the divide that I'm sure is between a lot of people on whether our main aim should be to undo humans damage, you know, make it look as much like it did before we messed with it or to make stable ecosystems regardless of what the animals doing the roles are. You know, it, that we yeah. we want the grasslands and a healthy ecosystem back. We can't get back the extinct ones, so modern elephants and bison and, you know, yeah. gazelle will have to do the job. So it's it's a really we're getting into questions that are now have a have a very interesting uh, yeah. divide between whether you you think it's a good answer or not. Absolutely, and again, you know, we're touching on a topic for an entire other podcast. Oh, absolutely, uh, conservation, and we'll talk more about it if people want to hear it. I do want to make a quick mention, and I know that we're you know we're toward the end. Yeah, quick mention. All of this talk about restoring ecosystems to the way they were back in the Pleistocene and restoring it to the normal state brings up the question yes, that I'm sure our listeners have been wondering this entire time. We have ancient DNA. Yes. Can't we clone and thus resurrect extinct species? And the short answer to that question is no, no, we cannot. No. I, I'm very sorry. Can't be done. The long answer to that question is a whole other episode. Yeah. That is de-extinction. That is a different topic. <laughs> it is. Like, it's, it touches in this topic. It is it definitely its own category. Yep. But that's about the extent of, of what I think we can cover in this episode, as goes conservation paleobiology. Mm -hmm. I, we touched on a lot of really interesting stuff over the course of that episode. A lot of those tangential topics might end up being their own episodes. Yeah, so if there's one that you particularly found interesting, let us know so that we can see what else there is to talk about it. Yes, please do. I, I hope that this episode demonstrates the fact that we are listening and we love your suggestions. Um, you know, topics like de-extinction are on the list already for us to do is, at some point. I will, yeah. I've, I've written a bit about it. I'd love to do that episode. Oh, we have to. Yeah, but if that's something that our listeners are suggesting, we'll bump it up on the list. Yeah, absolutely. We, we really do love getting to hear from all of you who who listen to our podcast. Uh, not only does it reaffirm for us that we, someone out there is listening, uh, yes. which is which is nice, um, <laughs> yes, it is. but it's really great to know that we seem to be scratching an itch that people you know had and wanted to know more on. So yes, and thanks for every time you you comment and feel free to do it more. Please do. Big thanks to Josh for yeah. making this suggestion. There are, like I said, there's a bunch of people who have made requests and suggestions. They all go on the list. Mm -hmm. um, 
I, we can't promise when we'll do them uh, for various reasons. Some of them might end up getting pushed off. Uh, some of them might be good options, you know, to do with a guest or something yeah. like that. But we promise they're all on the list. They're high on the list, so we don't forget them. Yep. Keep commenting. Keep making requests. Keep asking us questions. We had a, a delightful conversation on Facebook recently yes, with a, a listener who asked a bunch of cool questions. So, yes, we love hearing from you. We we hope that you continue to join us as we move almost at double digits in our episodes. It's getting crazy. How about that? Who knew, who knew that this was going to work out? <laughs> <laughs> we hoped. Yeah, it we was. Hope it it's, it's been quite a pleasure that... People are still listening. Indeed. And going up. Yeah. Our, our listener counts. Uh, the, the number one most listened to podcast has about 350 downloads, which tells me that there's at least 350 people who have listened to our podcast. <laughs> yep. Which is pretty cool. All right. I think that's it. Uh, once again, thank you, everybody, for joining us. We will be back in a fortnight. That's two weeks for uh, the next episode, episode nine. In the meantime, Facebook, Twitter, leave us reviews on iTunes. Tell your friends about us. Send us comments and questions. At, you can send us to Gmail, commadescentpodcast at gmail.com. Yes. Any of these ways to, to get in touch with us, to give us feedback. We'd love to hear from you. Until next time. Thanks for listening, everyone. That's I don't have a sign-off phrase. All right. Until next time, <laughs> click. Click. <laughs> <laughs> Until next time. Outro music. <laughs> I don't like saying goodbyes. Uh. <laughs>